The House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitations in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff uh, email the previously mentioned address or contact uh, our committee staff directly. Please keep your video function on at all times even when we're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. Please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Uh, I will mention that there will be some delays uh, in some of the back and forth with our witnesses uh, because of translation uh, time that, that would occur. Uh, and consistent with House Resolution 965 and the accompanying regulation, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate uh, background noise. Uh, I see that we do have a quorum. I thank all our members uh, that are here and that will be joining us. Uh, I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, pursuant to notice, we're holding a hearing today entitled Innovative Municipal Leadership in Central Europe, Founding Members of the Pact of Free Cities. I wanna thank you all for being here. Uh, thank our witnesses, uh, given the time zone uh, issues we have uh, for their participation, uh, it's extremely important. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this month is an important month for the Biden administration as they hold the Summit for Democracy. Uh, this event will bring together nations of similar values and principles to share best practices in democratic resiliency. Many of the nations invited have made great strides in terms of democratic development, including those in Central and Eastern Europe. Now, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall 32 years ago, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe made the transition from communism to democracy, developed market economies, and integrated into the transatlantic community. These countries are now members of the European Union, a union founded on economic integration, but bound by common values, such as freedom of the press, rule of law, and an independent judiciary. Together, they're sought to protect the basic human rights of their citizens while working to ensure access to the fundamentals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In addition, these countries have become strong national security partners of the United States and other members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. As such, Congress continues to develop and support these security alliances and work together with our European partners to address joint security challenge. This is the one advantage we all have together uh, in the face of uh, more malign activities in the world today. In addition, these countries have become strong national uh, partners. Uh, and unfortunately, however, uh, in recent years, many uh, of my colleagues and I in the transatlantic community, including civil society organizations like Freedom House, which assesses levels of democracy around the world, have become increasingly concerned with some policies and rhetoric that have emerged in Central Europe. Slovakia, Freedom House notes that, quote, while civil liberties are generally protected, democratic institutions are hampered by entrenched discrimination against the Roma community and growing political hostility towards migrants and refugees, unquote. And then they note that, quote, political corruption remains a problem. In the Czech Republic, Freedom House asserts that several corruption scandals and political disputes have, quote, hampered normal legislative activity, unquote, and that, quote, illiberal rhetoric and influence of powerful business entities in the political arena are becoming increasing, increasingly visible. In Poland, the rapid economic growth experience since 1989 has benefited some parts of the country more than others. Freedom House believes that this disparity in wealth has contributed to, quote, a, divide, a deep divide between liberal and pro-European parties and those purporting to defend national interests and traditional Polish Catholic values, unquote. The Law and Justice Party, which has uh, led the government of Poland since 2015, has encouraged anti-LGBTQI plus policies and attitudes, and politicized the judicial system, threatening to reverse much of Poland's democratic development. An increase in nationalist, homophobic, homophobic and anti-Semitic rhetoric has fueled concerns about the safety of minority communities in the country. While Freedom House ranks Slovakia, the Czech Republic and Poland as quote unquote free countries, there's no doubt there's work to be done 
to protect marginalized communities, uphold the rule of law, and to crack down on corruption activities. Finally, and most concerning, since 2019, Freedom House has classified Hungary as quote unquote, partly free. Hungary is the first EU member state to ever be designated as partly free. Following the election of Prime Minister Victor, Victor Orban in 2010, the governing uh, Fidesz party has published through constitutional legal challenges and, and they pushed through constitutional legal challenges rather that have allowed the party uh, doing what Freedom House describes to consolidate control over the country's independent institutions. These changes also, according to Freedom House, hamper the operation of opposition groups, journalists, universities, non-governmental organizations who criticize the government or whose perspective the government finds unfavorable. In recent years, the Central European Uni University has forced uh, to, to find a new home in Austria. Employees of the Moscow-based Russian international investment banks were given diplomatic status. Independent journalism has been threatened by de facto government control over much of the media. And the government has adopted legislation restricting the rights of transgender individuals, to name just a few, concerning policies, of course, that we've seen in Hungary. Overall, there's no doubt of the seriousness of the concerns regarding democracy in Central Europe. Malign influence in the region, particularly from Russia and China, encouraged democratic backsliding to slip further and further away from the ideals of our transatlantic alliance. Although the scope is different in the US than it is in Europe, we are also dealing with threats to our democracy through malign influence campaigns, disinformation, and more. Notably, Freedom House has downgraded the US's global freedom rankings by 11 points over the last decade. Only together, as a transatlantic community, can we tackle many of the problems facing our democracies. To meet these challenges and many others, our four witnesses here today launched the Pact of Free Cities. The Pact, launched in 2019 as an alliance of Central European mayors, has pledged to protect and advance liberal democracy, recognizing the challenge of, of democratic development in the region and establishing joint initiatives to solve climate, housing, and many other social issues that face these cities. The pact has since expanded from the original Visegrad four capitals to include over 20 cities from Los Angeles to Taipei who have joined in the fight to solve the world's challenges. Recognizing the progress being made in the pact today, I've invited the founding four members of the group, Matush Valo of Bratislava, Gurge Harishan of Budapest, Zednik Jeeb of Prague, Rafo Cheskowski of Warsaw. I've invited them to share with us the policies and programs they have initiate, initiated in their home cities. And we're so proud to have you as witnesses here today. As we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic here and around the world, local leadership is critical in times of peace and times of crisis to respond and prepare for emergencies, as well as to develop initiatives and innovative solutions to local and global challenges. For example, in the United States, during the previous administration, our country moved away from climate change commitments. But local leaders here in the US, from state and municipal governments, rose to the occasion and undertook environmental initiatives to reduce our carbon footprint. As such, like many of our people that are listening here today, I've read a lot about the local policies and programs developed by these mayors, these leaders, and I'm eager to hear from them directly. I'm proud to have the mayors here today and hear of their successes and their failures. With that, I welcome an opening statement from our ranking member, Mr. Brian Fitzpatrick, and then we'll call on the mayors in alphabetical order to present their testimony. I now turn to ranking member Brian Fitzpatrick for his opening remarks. Good morning and thank you, Chairman Keating, for yielding and thank you to our witness for, uh, witnesses for joining us today. Um, the cornerstone of this committee is the defense of democratic values around the world. Uh, we do so by supporting uh, the rule of law, um, independent media, peaceful assembly, religious freedom, and the ability to participate in the political process. And these democratic values form the backbone 
of the transatlantic bond between the United States and our European allies. And the strength of our NATO alliance is inextricably linked with the strength of our democracies. And as recognized in the Brussels NATO summit uh, communicated earlier this year, autocrats in China and Russia are actively leveraging predatory investments and hybrid tactics to sub, uh, subvert Western institutions. Uh, their coercive policies stand in stark contrast to the fundamental Western values that we all share. And our like-minded allies and partners need to prove that democracy, not autocracy, can provide more for the citizens of the world. And I've been encouraged by some of our witnesses' efforts to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party uh, and their bullying uh, and denouncing the threat uh, it and Vladimir Putin pose to all of our democracies. And I'd like to hear more from uh, Mr. Xi, whose approach in fighting authoritarianism has encompassed many topics uh, we've covered in this very committee. Uh, from meeting with civil society leaders like uh, Svetlana uh, Tsikhanovskaya uh, to defending uh, Uyghur survivors of the CCP concentration camps, uh, your efforts have included some of the most pressing issues on the planet. And particularly your efforts to strengthen relations with Taiwan are incredibly commendable and we thank you for them and we encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, both the Czech Republic and Slovakia have recently welcomed Taiwan's foreign minister and open dialogue to bolster strategic cooperation. Please keep this going. Uh, with that, I'd like to hear more about your decision, uh, decision making and standing up to the intimidations of the Chinese Communist Party and what more the transatlantic alliance can do to stand united in the face of their coercive behavior. Uh, Mr. Karachkong, uh, you also faced uh, the subversive, uh, subversive influence of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, when the proposed construction of uh, China's uh, Fudan University threatened to spread Beijing's influence at the expense of Hungarian taxpayers, you took a strong stand in opposition. And I'd like to hear from you on what motivated you to take these strong and principled stances, and we encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, Poland? And Mr. Uh, Czech Czechowski uh, have spoken out extensively on Putin's most glaring malign influence project, Nord Stream 2. Uh, I agree with your assessment that gas must never flow through Nord Stream 2 pipeline and your condemnation of Russia's increasingly aggressive posturing. Uh, please continue to do that and we encourage that and we support that. Firm opposition and clear eyed recognition the authoritarian threats are necessary to ensure freedom and democracy prevail around the globe. These goals must not be a partisan issue. The destabilizing malign actions uh, from Moscow and Beijing uh, and the threat that they pose to democracies across the globe demand and deserve our full attention. And I look forward to hearing from you all today uh, on these very, very pressing matters, particularly as it uh, relates to the uh, existential threats posed by the, the Chinese Communist Party and the Vladimir Putin regime. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. And uh, I'll now introduce our witnesses. Uh, again, thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for uh, your commitments to democracy. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Matush Valo is the mayor uh, of, uh, I'll do this right, Fritz. Uh, Britslava in, in uh, Slovakia. Uh, he's served in that position since 2018. And he's an architect by trade uh, and an urban activist, uh, someone who's brought those skills to his position. Uh, welcome. Mr. Gerge uh, Kershan has served as the mayor of Budapest, Hungary since 2019. He previously served as the mayor of Budapest 14th district, as well as a member of the Hungarian parliament. I want to note for the record that, that Mr. Karachan will speak in English for his opening statement, but use simultaneous translation for the question and answer portion of today's hearing. Uh, Mr. Zetnik Jeeb has been mayor of Prague, Czech Republic since 2018. He's a member of the Czech uh, Pirate Party and the first member of the party to be elected as mayor in the Czech Republic. Mr. Uh, Rafo Czeskowski, is the mayor of Warsaw, Poland, since 2018. In 2020, uh, Mr. Uh, Czaskowski was a civic platforms candidate for the presidency of Poland. In 2014, he served as deputy minister of foreign affairs for Poland. 
in 2013 as Minister for Administration and Digitalization. I, I now recognize each witness for five minutes and without objection, your prepared written statement will be made a part of the record. Uh, Mr. Bellow, uh, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope I, you can hear me. Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick, distinguished members of the committee, me and my colleagues, mayors from Central European capitals, we are honored to have the opportunity to be here today to discuss the situation in Central Europe and in our cities and to present our collaborative activities. The four us, uh, of us here today created the Pact of Free Cities two years ago from a very specific moment. The voters in our four capitals expressed a clear wish for an alternative to their corrupt and populist national governments. We realized that the, the mandate given to us exceeds the boundaries of our capitals. That we have become, whatever we thought that responsibility or not, standard bearers for democratic hopes of many in our countries. That is a mission we take seriously. And to better deliver it, we have teamed up uh, so as to share experience, to encourage uh, each other, but also to jointly represent the hopes of our countries abroad, as we are doing today. Uh, we are speaking to you at the moment of rising anti-democratic sentiment in uh, many national governments worldwide. Across the world, uh, public trust in the liberal democracy has weakened uh, partly because of our democratically elected leaders are failing to lead. Central Europe is in the eye of the storm. Our democracies are young and therefore more vulnerable to than countries with strong democratic institutions and centuries of democratic tradition. We are still searching for a new identity that will define us in 21st century. We are no longer countries in transition. We are no longer defined by being ex-communists. But what kind of societies exactly do we aspire to be that has not been settled yet? Western liberal democracies should be a natural model, but Western democracies themselves are under pressure from populists at home. Countries with much longer democratic traditions than ours have fallen victim to the populist bug. The global crisis of democracy has encouraged, encouraged cynics back home in Central Europe. When you no longer have a clear beacon to follow, it becomes easier for, for populists to peddle alternatives. We Democrats sell the idea of a positive future, but that is often too distant, blurry things. Far-right leaders sell the idea of hate, which is immediate, almost tangible, and sadly, far too catchy. They say that when the goes gets tough, the tough gets going, and that is what the mayors on the screen in front of you have done. We believe that the best way to represent democracy through direct experience, when people experience trust and freedom on local level, it ceases to be that distant destination which may never be reached. It is here and now, and if it can work in a city, why not in a country? If cities can have transparent public institutions that deliver a good service, which is very important, good services, why should the nation not have the same? That is what we do. We stand as an example. Where the national governments are failing, the cities and regions continue to be island of freedom and democracy, not only serving their citizens, but also serving as an example to others in our nations. Honorable Member of Congress, owing to our intertwined history and cultural proximity, we can stand together stronger as the mayors of free cities in Central Europe and offer each other solidarity, mutual support and collaboration in good times and bad. We in Slovakia closely watch the difficult situation of our colleagues in Hungary and Poland who have to stand for the basic pillars of democracy because we know that democracy is in fact fragile everywhere and we must stand up for it together. We all must stand together. In 2020 general election in Slovakia, people voted for radical change after the tragic murder of journalist Jan Kuciak and his fiancée Martina Kushnirova. The Slovak people clearly rejected the sitting government with its close ties to corruption. The new ruling coalition has declared war on corruption and is committed to high standards of transparency. 
Unfortunately, the reality of governance, especially in COVID-19 pandemics, is proving that the anti-corruption agenda itself, however sincere, is not enough for effective leadership of the country. The crisis needs trustworthy leaders who can stand up together and fight for the common good. If they don't, any political program can slip into, into the empty and dangerous populism. This is why I strongly believe that is the mainly the building of trust that lead us uh, through the tough times, and it's extremely important to invest in it. If we, as city leaders, manage to renew the trust of our the democratic institution, our cities could mediate and implement the key cultural change since the imminent threats, whatever it is a climate crisis or democratic crisis, can be only overcome through a completely new political culture and profound changes to the way of life and thinking of our societies. Let's stand in this uneasy fight for democratic and positive future together. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Mr. Bello. I'll now turn to Mr. Karachan. You're now recognized for your opening statement. Chairman Keating, ranking members, with Patrick, distinguished members of subcommittee. I am honored to speak with you today on behalf of the people of Budapest. Today I will speak about the decline of democracy in Hungary, and I will also speak about the mayors in Hungary and internationally are doing to safeguard democratic principles. Honorable members, just as in the United States, the global financial crisis in 2008 hit very hard in Hungary. Orban Viktor exploited social discontent and built a new form of hybrid regime between democracy and autocracy. The government forced through a new, new constitution, changed the electoral law, crushed civil society and occupied the media. In foreign policy, the government broke with Hungary's pro-European and transatlantic orientation. It's declared an opening to the East and drastically increased collaboration with Russia and China. Hungary's two most expensive public investment projects both serve the interests of these countries. The Budapest Belgrade Railway, part of the Belt and Road Initiative, is being financed by a Chinese loan. Similarly, the nuclear power plant in Paksh is financed by Russia, serving Russian interest. And details of both contracts are kept secret. The government also employs Putin's methods. Last year, the Speaker of the National Assembly told Hungarian intelligence services that the opposition is the greatest national security threat in Hungary. Yet, the actions speak just as loud as the words. From 1918, Pegasus spyware has been used against Hungarian journalists, businessmen, and opposition politicians, and there is no sight that intelligence operations have stopped. Honorable members of Congress, there is hope. I assure you that the Hungarian government's values do not mirror those of Hungarian society. Millions of my fellow citizens embrace a very different political agenda. In 2019, these voters made their voice heard when the democratic opposition won key positions in Budapest and in many other cities and towns. Running these cities and towns became more difficult because the central government chose to financially squeeze opposition-led local governments. Yet, we managed to showcase once more the value of democratic, respectful, and inclusive governance model to Hungarian citizens. This, together with the democratic opposition rallying together from the first time in the more than a decade, provide us with a unique opportunity to defeat Orban's nationalist populism in April next year and restore Hungary's rightful standing in the transatlantic alliance. Honorable members of Congress, Lastly, on the Pact of Free Cities. We believe that cities where democracy was born have a responsibility to protect it and improve it. 
and we are proud to represent a broad ideological spectrum who say no to tribalism and illiberalism and aspire for a livable, equitable, and truly democratic future. Recognizing what the values and challenges that our initiative is based on, on transcend the center Eastern European region, we have decided to expand our alliance and cities worldwide are answering our call. Earlier, earlier this year, 21 city leaders from all over the world signed to the new Pact of Free Cities Declaration, and more mayors will be joining soon. The pacts stand ready to work with American cities and US Congress to address all the threats to undermine our democracies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for those uh, very uh, uh, significant statements, and we look forward to questions uh, as we go forward. Uh, and I'll turn to uh, Mr. Dajib. Uh, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick, and distinguished guest members, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, it is a great honor for me that you have invited me to speak at this platform alongside my colleagues from Central European capitals. And I'm happy to provide a few remarks on the state of democracy in the Czech Republic and on the role of the cities in defending global democratic principles and human rights. Considering the increasing urbanization worldwide, it is inevitable that cities are important stakeholders in defending freedom and democracy. And this brought Prague, Budapest, Bratislava and Warsaw together to establish the Pact of Three Cities in 2019. And another driving force was our shared concern about the state of democracy in our respective countries. Just to name a few examples from Czech Republic, in the previous decade, the government of the business tycoon Andrei Babiš was accompanied by an unprecedented conflict of interest. And his ways of governing and his scandals undermined the rule of law, press freedom and other crucial democratic values. President Zeman dragged the Czech Republic closer to China and Russia and the Czech foreign policy experienced a diversion from human rights agenda. And the fear of migration became a new political topic misused by populist politicians. I became the mayor of Prague in 2018, representing the Czech Pirate Party. And one of my aims was to restore Prague's reputation as an open-minded, liberal, democratic and progressive city, which is a stronghold of human rights and a local leader in tackling climate change. And I have been strongly promoting these values domestically often in opposition to the national government. And I have been also actively voicing concerns over violations of human rights abroad. This is a moral duty of liberal democratic politicians. For instance, Prague has been supporting the Belarusian democratic opposition. We have fostered a brilliant relationship with Taiwan and Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. And just a few weeks ago, the General Assembly of the World Uyghur Congress. And I had the privilege to meet Uyghur survivors from the Xinjiang concentration camps. And I was horrified to hear what they had experienced. And I would like to use this opportunity to call on the international community to work towards ending these concentration camps, the forced labor, uh, forced organ harvesting, and this Uyghur genocide. I would like also to emphasize my belief that truly democratic and liberal cities should not be servile to illiberal countries such as China and Russia, which try to exercise their business-related and political influence also on the municipal level. And currently, Czech Republic is going through a crucial political change. The populist government of Andrei Babiš is being replaced. The new coalition is pledging to restore democratic principles and the rule of law in the country. And I would like to emphasize that this positive development in the Czech Republic does not mean that Prague would be less dedicated to the mission of the Pact of Free Cities. On the contrary, our experience with the previous populist government was a reminder of the fragile nature of democracy. 
And there is a lot of work ahead in order to strengthen the vital values in our society. And Prague is ready to keep supporting our partners. So in addition to the original aims, I see an important task for the PAC nowadays. We should promote the link between human rights and the crucial contemporary global challenge of climate change. So in September 2022, Prague will be hosting the Pact of Free Cities Summit during the Czech Republic's EU presidency. And this will be an opportunity to bring all the member cities of this growing alliance together and to voice our readiness to fight for democracy, human rights and a fairer, cleaner and more resilient society. And before I conclude, I would like to quote the former mayor of Denver, Wellington Webb. He said, the 19th century was a century of empires, the 20th century was a century of nation states, and the 21st century will be the century of cities. And I would like to slightly modify this great quote by adding that we need to strive towards a century of responsible, sustainable, and truly democratic cities. And this is how we make a real difference and help the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Z. Uh, now turn to uh, Mr. Uh, Jaiskowski. Uh, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Chairman Keating, uh, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick, distinguished members of the subcommittee. On November 1989, Lech Wałęsa addressed the United States Congress with his famous We the People speech. Today, the populist government in Poland is trying to write its own version of history and wipe out Lech Wałęsa from history books. Can you believe that? It is only because of the courage of our teachers that Polish children still learn about our historical hero. Poland has not been yet turned into an undemocratic regime thanks to the strength of the parties of the parliamentary opposition and the courage and dynamism of our civil society. As the opinion polls clearly demonstrate that if the opposition were to be united, it would win the next parliamentary election. Honorable members of Congress, Poland is a battlefield between freedom and authoritarianism, between democratic society and the populist government that tries to paralyze or politicize the independent institutions meant to control the excesses of unbridled governmental power. In times when the international context in Poland's neighborhood is so volatile, the Russians are amassing troops on the Ukrainian border, the Kremlin is weaponizing energy policy, and Lukashenko has his hand in provoking the migratory crisis on our eastern border, the transatlantic community cannot afford to have a weak link in our part of Europe. Regrettably, I must confirm the negative developments taking place in our country enumerated by the chairman, confirming the assessments of independent experts. Regardless of what the populist government in Poland claims, the knowledge of these developments is well known and is a source of concern for the friends of Polish democracy. I therefore confirm that most importantly, the constitutional tribunal has been turned into a partisan political body which rubber stamps the illegal actions of the government. The government unleashed a vicious media campaign against the LGBTQI community and is trampling over women's rights, proposing a draconian anti-abortion law. Moreover, the Constitutional Tribunal has recently issued a very controversial ruling undermining our membership in the European Union. The Polish public media became a blunt propaganda instrument of the governing party, which at the same time is also trying to limit the freedom of independent media. The government also restricts the prerogatives of local communities, excessively centralizing power in its hands. Honorable members of Congress, Poland still is a democracy because the overwhelming majority of Poles have not given up their fight. Over the past years, we have seen hundreds of thousands of men and women gathered on the streets of Poland to protest against the government. And the measures described above have been met with a staunch opposition of the civil society. The iron will of the freedom-loving Poles has not been broken. We all fight for an open, free society which cherishes common values and diversity. Honorable members of Congress, I would like to appeal to you and everyone in the US government. Sustain your commitment to Poland, countries of the region, and Europe as a whole. Keep on promoting the values of democracy and human rights. Support civil society, NGOs, and local government's initiatives. And above all, don't lose hope for Poland because the democratic forces will be back. Honorable members of Congress, 
A liberal democracy is an oxymoron. You either stay true to the common values of democracy or you slide into authoritarianism. We must protect the common values of democracy together. The US engagement in Europe and in Poland guarantees our peace, freedom, and democracy. The chairman is absolutely right. If a vacuum is created in our part of Europe, it will be filled by malign influence from Russia and China. We all need a strong eastern flank of the North Atlantic Alliance, democratic and resilient, and most importantly, inoculated against manipulation and propaganda. We see our membership in the European Union and NATO, as well as strong relations with the United States of America, as a guarantee of our independence. That is why we treat the commitments to overall security of the continent and the world so seriously. But solidarity of all partners is required in the face of serious threats. Therefore, therefore, I strongly urge the US Congress to prevent Russia from having a leverage against the EU and NATO members in the form of Nord Stream 2 and introduce further sanctions on the Russian regime. Honorable members of Congress, regardless of what happens in Poland today, do not lose hope. I remain confident that Poland will be back as a strong, proud and democratic member of the transatlantic community. We, the signatories of the Pact of Free Cities, remain committed to uphold the democratic values, protect minorities, fight for tolerance and transparency, and realize the common ambitious goals of the Western community. You know, whatever the government is not doing, we are doing it. We teach tolerance at poor schools. We prioritize women's rights. We support independent cultures and, NBO and NGOs. And we seriously fight for climate change, with the climate change because that's what the proud citizens of Warsaw and of Poland expect from us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And be assured uh, we are not giving up in Poland. Uh, be assured that we understand uh, in all your countries how important our relationships are in a transatlantic way. And be assured too that all of your testimony here had a common thread of making sure that basic democratic freedoms are our core and our strength. We certainly have security needs together uh, and under greater threats than we've seen in decades. Yet democracy and our security needs don't travel uh, in different lanes. They travel together and are strengthened together. And your opening statements uh, of all of you uh, indicates how important that is going forward. So I thank you for your testimony. I'll recognize members for five minutes each and pursuant to the House rules, uh, all time yielded is for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, I'll recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, uh, please let our staff know and we'll circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. I'll now recognize myself uh, for five minutes with questions. Uh, I thank all of you for the work you're doing. Uh, and you are terrific examples of how the importance of major cities, municipalities, and obviously uh, their importance to the surrounding communities uh, of cities, how important that is. And you've raised issues of transparencies of contracts and freedoms uh, uh, of the press, basic human rights issues, all cores to what we're dealing with. And you understand in all of your roles uh, that uh, this isn't, these aren't issues that end at the city barriers. Uh, they transcend not only the cities through the suburban areas, through the country as a whole, but globally, and along those lines, uh, I've noticed uh, your work and, and the Pact of Free Cities work on climate change. Uh, here in our own country, uh, during the last four years, as some of we reneged on some of our commitments here in the US globally, which we've now uh, moved forward to reconstruct. But so many of our states and cities move forward during this period, so importantly. So, I'd ask all of you, if, if you'd like, just to jump in to talk about the work you have done on climate change and how your work uh, has been so important and transformative and how it translates to the people you represent. 
Uh, maybe perhaps I'll start with Mr. Bello. And then the others can jump in. Thank you very much. Uh, we, of course, I'm, I'm having a lot of support in the United, United States. Uh, me, as a mayor of Warsaw, Rafael, are members of, of, uh, of curriculum from a film Bloomberg called uh, Bloomberg Harvard uh, City Leadership Initiative. And we're taking a lot of know-how from different American cities and from this organization as well. And we, one of the main thing, of course, for us uh, to fight climate change is, uh, is everything is green. Uh, we have this program called 10,000 Trees. I know it's not a million trees like in New York City, but we have 10,000 trees uh, on, and we are planting a lot of trees. And of course, we know the effect of, of trees today. It's not only uh, thin, uh, scientifically uh, database effect. Uh, we know how what is happening to rainy water on CO2, but it's also very important for health of our citizen. And this is just one of the programs we we working a lot of public space. That's something we kind of having this program of new of complete renewal of public space in Bratislava. That's very important for us. Uh, very important agenda against our minorities. Uh, we have. We have, as every city in the world today, problem with citizens without a home. We are spending a lot of effort, energy of trying to ensure every everybody can own uh, own bed for the night and uh, own own house, and that's very important for us. So we're trying to just go with this already tested and already working agenda of other cities, which are maybe a little bit. Um, a little bit more more years in the game and trying to follow good examples and that's important for us. thank you so much i'd just like to see if uh, mr cheskowski uh, might want to uh, uh, also add to this and and reassure him that we had elect walenza here in this committee uh, as a witness uh, just a, a couple of years ago and i saw him connect to younger people here uh, as he did back home so importantly uh, and the climate change issue also connects generation. What have you been doing? Yes, <clears throat> yes, indeed. Uh, and when Lech Valenza uh, was uh, having his famous speech, uh, uh, I was working at the Capitol Hill for, for a month with John Dingle. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, to what we are doing, when it comes to f uh, fighting climate change, I mean, you know, our government, the, the conservative government of, of Poland, of law and justice is very lukewarm towards the idea of of, uh, of global warming, and un unfortunately, of course, they've ta they've taken some commitments, but unfortunately, they are not very diligent in implementing them. So it's again the cities which have to do it on our own, and I've declared that Warsaw will be uh, carbon neutral by 2050, even with our very difficult energy mix, and we are doing a number of things in Warsaw. Of course, raising awareness. Uh, priori prioritizing public transportation. We invest uh, billions of euros in public transportation. We're greening our city. We're eliminating um, coal-powered stoves. We are helping citizens in using renewables, and we are paying for that. We are doing quite a lot in order to, to actually uh, meet uh, the priorities of the European Union and of the world, uh, because we have to take uh, some of that responsibility ourselves. Right. Well, thank you. And uh, I make note of the fact that our Secretary of Energy uh, for the United States, Secretary Grenholm, uh, one of her first stops was in Poland, and it opens the door, not just there, but around the world, for important cooperation between the U.S. and all our, particularly our transatlantic allies, which will create not just uh, a greener environment, but also more jobs and more independence security-wise from uh, other powers that are don't share our values. So there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in this area uh, for mutual growth. And I wish I could go to everyone, but my time has expired. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully some of the other members will follow up with questions in this regard. So I'll now turn for questioning uh, to uh, Representative Muser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And to the ranking member Fitzpatrick, uh, thank you very much, mayors, for joining us this morning. Um, incredibly interesting and informative. Thank you. Uh, in the, in the, uh, your cities uh, over the course of the 20th century, of course, survived Nazi occupation, Soviet communism, 
uh, throughout the Soviet area, we saw uprisings, notably in Hungary, in Prague in 1968, the Solidarity Movement in Poland, uh, the Velvet Rev Revolution in 1989, brought an end to communism in Czechoslovakia. So today, freedom uh, is again under, under threat. Uh, China continues to crack down on Hong Kong's autonomy and, and threatens Taiwan. Uh, Russia, similarly, is cracking down on, on opposition and threatening various sovereignties of its neighbors and the militarization of the Ukraine border. So, uh, uh, Mayor Harib, uh, you've been a strong supporter of Taiwan and Tibet, hosting uh, Tibetan and Taiwanese officials and, and replacing Beijing as, as uh, Prague's sister city with Taipei. So, Mr. Mayor, how has Beijing responded to these actions? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Moser, for this question. Well, uh, the fact is that, of course, they are trying to threaten us. And the logic or, or their narrative, or actually it's not mainly the narrative that will be, would be told by them. They are using some sort of proxies to to speak up uh, for them. So, for example, in Prague, we have found that a company which is business interests in China, because they have a company which sells the mobile phones on installments there, and uh, is, by the way, a company owned by the richest Czech guy, this is recently. However, they have created a whole network of politicians, journalists, sort of academical uh, people to support their view of China. And they've had these uh, invoices, uh, payments, and uh, for the exact uh, job done in this matter. And this was all published because this, it leaked into the media. And in this way, they are trying to form the public opinion. So, for example, their primary narrative is that if we damage the relationship with China, the economy of the whole country will be damaged. But specifically in case of Czech Republic, I'm not sure about the other V4 countries, but I believe it could be pretty much the same. The business influence of China is actually quite overrated because uh for example there were promises of billions for the investment from china into czech industry but actually only a fraction of them happened and they were not investments there were mainly acquisitions of already existing sports clubs breweries and uh, other things so it was not about investments with know-how transfer or creating new jobs and so on. So when, for example, we have done this uh, trip to Taiwan with our chairman of the upper chamber of our parliament, Miloš Vistočil, uh, there was a, a huge, huge uh, threats from China about the impact of this trip on the Czech economy and the net result the net result was that some Chinese company uh, was not uh, cancelled their uh, plan to buy 11 pianos from a Czech company which meant a loss of five millions of Czech crowns which is roughly tens of thousands of euros and these pianos were actually immediately bought by a sponsor of uh, music of classical music in czech republic and they were donated to schools so Mayor, uh, this um, is... I, think, I think we're out of time uh yeah thank you uh, i appreciate is... it i yield back mr chairman I think you're on mute, Mr. Chairman. See, they're already muting us. Uh, but uh, I now turn, thank you very much for your testimony and uh, your questioning. Uh, I now turn to the Vice Chair of the Committee, Ms. Spanberg. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to say thank you to all of our guests today. Thank you for being here. 
uh, and to answer our questions and in your opening statements were extraordinary. Uh, these virtual hearings really do allow us to engage with experts and government officials from around the world. So I appreciate uh, you making the time to speak with us. Um, Mr. Cheskovsky, I'd like to ask you a couple questions um, to begin with. The United States and Poland have a strong security partnership through the NATO alliance. Um, but as we know, the types of security challenges that localities are facing continue to evolve. So I'd really like to hear more about how Warsaw is working to build um, some resiliency against the emerging security challenges, be they climate change or cybersecurity um, or other kind of on the ground physical threats. What efforts are underway in Warsaw to combat these security threats? And, and is there any structure of engagement um, uh, internationally that, that exists? Well, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, today there are threats of very different nature because we see what's happening on the eastern border of Poland, where, you know, the migratory crisis is being created or helped by, by Lukashenko uh, and his regime. We also see what's happening on the border of Russia and Ukraine. And of course, it gives us uh, a lot of uh, grounds uh, to, to be worried. But uh, for us, on, on the level of the cities, you know, the biggest threats are, are of course, the threats of a hybrid nature, because, you know, the, 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 the war is now waged differently. So, first of all, there is a question of our resilience when it comes to energy, and that's why, you know, I, uh, in my introductory statements, I, I was so strong about uh, Nord Stream, and that's why we do so much to fight climate change, uh, not only because we have to save the planet, but also because we uh, cannot allow uh, Russians and others to use energy as a leverage. That's why we invest as much as we can in renewables. Uh, that's why we green our cities. That's why we increase uh, the resilience. But of course, there is also a, a problem of, of cybersecurity. And you know, we, the mayors, we cannot do a lot because this is uh, this is a responsibility of of the government. But what we try to do, we try to talk to the kids. We try to introduce programs at schools where we teach what manipulation is and how it can be used and 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 to sift information so that students know what they're talking about but unfortunately this populist government is trying to uh, push all the NGOs out of schools because they want to uh, uh, to to uh, to have schools for for, for their own for, for, for their own purposes where they try to uh, introduce um, uh, a bit of propaganda so they're pushing out NGOs who for example teach tolerance or teach resilience when it comes to cyber we do what we can Interesting. In in terms of um, engagement with companies that might be impacted um, by um, cyber attacks, or what is the stru what is the structure in terms of your ability as the the mayor of such a large city to either be part of the education you mentioned to to students for issues related to propaganda, but how about to to companies and to commerce within your city in terms of the threats that exist online to them? Well, again, you know, this is a this is a problem which which needs to be addressed on, on the governmental level. I was a minister of digitization, you know, seven years ago, so I know this problem pretty well. We on the local government, we cannot do much, but there's a lot we can do together because at the end of the day, uh, when we talk about cyber, we need to collaborate within NATO, within the European Union. We need to talk to the big giant American companies uh, when it comes to resilience. I will just give you one example. Recent recently the government used the Pegasus. Uh, this is like a, a device produced in Israel, which allows to catch terrorists. But Apple had to actually send a warning to one of our prosecutors that the government in Poland is using it against prosecutors. And sometimes there are doubts whether it is using such instruments against the members of the opposition. So we need to address these questions. We need to ask these questions. And you also need to ask these questions to, uh, to the Polish government, because there are quite serious doubts about that. And of course, there is a question of regulating the big tech companies. We can only do it together, the European Union and with the United States of America, because we need to protect the free speech and we need to protect the possibilities uh, that you know technology gives us. But we need to also be quite worried about cybersecurity and that you know those capabilities can be used for adverse purposes by populist governments. Thank you for that. My, my next question, which you actually got to in your answer, was focused on how democratic values and, and human rights, we, we see them across the world, are, are under threat and what the role that, that cities um, can have in strengthening and revitalizing some of these principles. You, you spoke about 
making sure children are aware of propaganda, certainly um, the example that you gave of prosecutors being being monitored. Um, you know, I, I do hope that in the future, Mr. Chairman, we can talk about how the international community can support um, cities and and um, and leaders like Mayor Chesovsky as they're working to um, fight those threats that exist. So thank you very much for your answers. Thank you to all the witnesses, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Very much, and uh, thank you for your comments on bringing home the point uh, how renewables create energy independence and how critical that is to our security right now. All these issues uh, overlap. Now, uh, turn to Representative Fluger for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I don't want to start this conversation by immediately disagreeing uh, on renewables and energy independence, but, uh, but what we're talking about here is baseload power. Baseload power, and and I come from a district. I, I'm sorry, this was not the uh, the line of questioning that I was going to start with, but my district produces more wind energy than the entire state of California, and and it's wonderful for the state of Texas. But I've talked, I've had dozens of conversations with um, from the Baltic states through Central Europe uh, and all the way into the Balkans, and one of the the major concerns that I am hearing from every single country is the malign influence that's being basically held hostage uh, on the energy front. And I, Mr. Chairman, I agree with, with the need to diversify sources. Uh, and that's, that's not only the type of energy, but it's also the, uh, where the, the energy originates from. And so what I'd like to focus on, um, and maybe, maybe we'll start with, uh, um, with Dr. Uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, but I'd like to hear from all of you on the three C's initiative. You know, we've, we've had a pledge of, a billion dollars, uh, 300 million, an initial tranche that's been delayed. And I kind of want to hear how that would counter the influence that we're seeing in things like the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Dr. Uh, Tchaikovsky, over to you. Thank you for uh, for all the, the witnesses, but uh, I'll start with you and then like to get to the other witnesses as well. A pertinent uh, question, very important. I mean, that's the problem that that some of of of, of those countries actually use energy as a leverage and uh, use energy security to influence the situation in in countries such as Poland and that's why all the initiatives that we have mentioned are so important it is very important to work within NATO and within the European Union to counter that and to we have created an energy union we have created quite a lot of tools to give us independence but unfortunately you know there are some decisions on the table which we, which try to sort of round, go go round it, and when you uh, and when you mentioned the initiative of, of 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 three C's, fine. That's another initiative which can actually make us a bit more independent. For example, of the Chinese influence. You know, they've invented this format sixteen plus one in order to have more influence in the Balkans, uh, especially in those countries which are not members uh, of uh, of uh, uh, the European Union. So it's immensely important for us to use all of those initiatives in order to make us stronger, more resilient and more independent. Uh, and at the end of the day, we need to collaborate. We in the European Union and of course, uh, the United States of America, uh, because we are the beacons of, of freedom and only us working together, we can actually counter those malign influences. And that's why it is so incredibly important that countries such as Poland and Hungary remain democratic. We cannot have a weak, weak link here. Well, thank you for that, and I appreciate the acknowledgement of, of all the initiatives, specifically 3Cs, countering uh, CCP influence or, or, or others. So, um, and I'll just open it up at this point um, to, to anyone that has an opinion on the delay of the, the funding that, that has been promised to, to the tune of $300 million um, through this 3Cs. Can anyone speak to whether or not that's hurting uh, or, or how, how it would help would be a better way to pose this question? Congressman, I, I will just say one sentence. I mean, if uh, the European Union upholds its commitments as it always does, because we are a member of this organization, but if the United States stay committed uh, and help us in investing, then there is no room for other investment. No one can, you know, uh, yeah. show us a carrot and, 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 and try to say that they have a better idea. That's why it is absolutely crucial that you keep your engagement in, in, in Europe. Then there is no room for anyone else. Well, that, that's Europe the kind of point that I'm 
trying to make is that our commitment, it needs to be our commitment. Mr. Vallo, uh, uh, just over to you. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Just very, very few words. I mean, in all of this, I mean, nobody's happy to be, co uh, co uh, to be forced in the corner by, by energy crisis. That's what was happening uh, during these weeks in, in here. And uh, I mean, the, 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 I want to point out the word uh, uh, Mayor Trashkowski already mentioned is collaboration. That's the only way how we're going to survive. We, as, we are the small nation uh, here we, with our neighbors, which are a much bigger country as, as a Hungary, Poland, and also Czech Republic. So we are completely dependent on, on EU right now, and uh, we are completely dependent on good collaboration uh, with these uh, V4 countries, and our uh, and their democracy is absolutely necessary also for us. Well, thank you. Uh, does anyone in the last 15 seconds have any thoughts on uh, Lithuania's decision uh, to pull out of the 17.1 plus one and to, uh, to fully support Taiwan? Well, uh, if I may uh, just say one sentence, of course, I uh, support that. But uh, that is a thing that is very, very, always very specific to a certain country and uh, the points of it. Uh, for me, as a medical doctor, I would perhaps would like to emphasize, and I always emphasizing that if I'm asked about this question about supporting Taiwan, I would like to support the membership of Taiwan in WHO because that is something that has been proven that is crucial nowadays as we face the global pandemic. As they obviously knew it's coming, they have prepared and their experience is crucial if we look on what had Chinese done and how they basically lied to the world. Well, Mayor, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but thank you for this uh, hearing, the opportunity uh, with the witnesses giving us uh, their testimony. Thank you, Representative. The Chair recognizes Representative Susan Weil, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor Vallo, you write in your testimony that the climate crisis is also a democracy crisis, and the viability of our democracies will be tested by their capacity to face the existential danger of global warming and ability to mitigate its negative impact on our societies. My question is about the intersection of these two challenges. We are seeing an alarming tendency of xenophobic leaders on both sides of the Atlantic who oppose strong action on the global climate crisis while seeking political gain by demonizing the growing numbers of immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who seek safe harbor, at least in part due to the many direct and indirect ways that the climate crisis is destabilizing their societies. How do you assess this dual crisis and what lessons have you learned from your time as mayor that can help us find solutions, particularly when it comes to helping people see through attempts to scapegoat and divide our societies? Thank you very much. I mean, the, the, for me, the, what I learned in, during the last three years is that any reform, any, maybe sometimes, of, of course, data-based decision, must, it's, for this is very important to have a trust of our citizen. That the main thing, and uh, of course, climate crisis, to, to today we have a data which is saying exactly what is going to happen in the next years. And we know everybody who believes data and science know that climate crisis is here, it's happening. But you still have people, you have still president and prime, prime minister who are saying that is not an issue. So, so the trust to, to general trust, not only in uh, politics, but only to the, uh, to the science, scientists and in, in the numbers and in everybody who wants to be transparent and democratic is, is absolutely pivotal here. And this is what we are doing in a very small scale in a half million city, Bratislava, we're trying to build a good trust and good relationship with our citizen. All right, thank you. And I'd like to direct my next question to Mayor Trzaskowski. Um, sir, you write in your testimony, the Polish public media, the biggest media outlet in our country, funded with taxpayer money, ceased to be an objective source of information but instead formed a part of the ruling party's propaganda machine aimed at fighting the opposition. 
I ex this is still your quote. I experienced that dur that during the presidential election in 2020, when all pu public news programs openly turned against my candidacy, spreading crude propaganda and misinformation at the same time, openly supporting my opponent. Can you elaborate for us on some of the specific ways the Polish public media work to undermine your candidacy and support the incumbent president? Well, uh, you, you understand to, you, you need to understand one thing. I mean, uh, the, the Polish uh, public media is first of all funded by taxpayers' money. And this is the only channel which can be reached everywhere in Poland. I mean, other independent channels, by the way, which are under attack by the law and justice government uh, are much more difficult to reach. And, you know, I'm almost 50, so I remember the communist propaganda. It was much more subtle than what they do now on public TV. And it's not only my campaign, uh, where all the independent institutions said that the campaign in Poland was still free, but not fair, because all the outlets were attacking me, presenting manipulations, all the time, twisting facts, uh, and of course, spending much more time covering uh, the, uh, the president. But it's more that they use it actually to stoke fears that they've started a vicious campaign against the LGBT uh, plus uh, people, that they're uh, saying incredible things about uh, refugees and, and, and they're magnifying the threats. The threats are there, let's not minimize them. We need a strong border uh, in Eastern Poland, but we cannot simply allow for this propaganda to spread uh, because uh, manipulations are, are then spread all around Poland. And they're using it all the time, constantly, uh, to, to do that. And that's why um, it is very problematic in, in Poland to wage a normal fair campaign because you can spend just a small amount of money and all the state institutions, uh, propaganda included, are used against uh, the uh, opposition. Uh, and that's why the government is also undertaking, the peace government, the conservative, the populist government is now uh, undertaking to, to, to actually limit the freedom of, uh, of other independent outlets and press. One example to end this, a state-owned company, an oil company, was asked by the government to buy local press. And they bought newspapers, you know, in order to, 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 to kill some of those local, local newspapers and turn them to the government and again, and again, uh, and again sell propaganda. Thank you. Uh, we, we are seeing the buying of uh, media outlets throughout our country as well. So I'm very sensitive to that. Thank you very much, Mayor. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Very interesting line uh, of questioning. Uh, Chair recognizes Representative Deutsch for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for calling this hearing. Thanks to the mayors for participating. Um, I, I just uh, I want to echo what some of our colleagues have said. I think this is not just a um, an interesting hearing. Uh, it is it's critical to the way that we think about Europe, to the way that we think about the challenges in Europe. And I have to say to all of the mayors who are participating. Uh, your your words today and the and the way that you govern and uh, the commitment that you show to uh, to liberal democracy is inspiring and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I want to I want to follow up on some of the the conversation about the uh, pact uh, of free cities um, and uh, and then the members of the pact of free cities and looking ahead to the summit. For democracies that uh, that the Biden White House is going to be hosting, uh, I, I'd like to know whether the Pact of Free Cities is participating in the Summit for Democracy, and, and what you'd like to see as local leaders result from the Summit for Democracy. Since in your countries, what you're doing is so critical to uh, to that effort to sustain democracy. So, I, uh, Mayor Chuskowski, well, I guess we could start with you. Well. Uh, the problem today is that if we really want to meet uh, the challenges that are, that are before us head on, you cannot do it without the cities. I mean, if you really want to fight climate change, if you want to resolve the, 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 the problems of uh, education, migration and so on and so forth, we need to do it together. And that's why it is very important to also recognize the role of the cities. Uh, 
And for example, when our friends in the European Union, but also in, 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 in the US are exacerbated by our governments, I mean, that's, that's why it is absolutely crucial that we talk to each other, that, that we keep on supporting the NGOs, that we keep on fighting for minorities, and that we keep on realizing common priorities. And that's why we decided to, to actually set up the Pact of Free Cities. And that's why very different cities from all around the world, from, from Paris to London to Los Angeles, are joining because we have the same problems. And, and we are doing the benchmarking. We are learning from, from one another what to do. We are adopting best practices in order to meet those challenges head on. And that's why I'm very much satisfied that, that there is a side event on Monday uh, that Great. mayors were invited to. I will be there with the mayor of Minneapolis and Jakarta. Great. Thank you. Mayor Caraton? Ma mayor Caraton? You can hear? Köszönöm a kérdést, ami sajnos Magyarországot különösen érinti, hiszen for Hungary, since uh, now we here in the Hungarian press today and uh, unfortunately soon in the international press we heard that uh, Hungary wasn't invited by the Biden administration to this democratic summit. Uh, I think this is a clear signal uh, about the future of uh, democracy. Uh, U.S. would like to talk with countries who are building and uh, not uh, demolishing democracy. And now the Hungarian government is trying to uh, ban the EU to join this summit uh, and say uh, that the EU cannot represent all countries since uh, Hungary is not invited. This is a rather typical uh, way of reasoning from Viktor Orban, who always uh, equals himself to the nation, to the whole of the nation. And he always says that he's representing all Hungarians. Uh, as a, as a government, uh, if uh, they are criticized, uh, he always says that uh, every criticism is directed to the whole of the nation. And now uh, he's trying to block uh, the EU participation on this summit uh, and say that uh, EU cannot talk uh, on behalf of Hungary. When I was invited uh, to this uh, forum, I'm not speaking uh, on behalf of uh, Hungary. I tried to speak on behalf of uh, the population of Budapest uh, and uh, and about the values that I believe. Of course, in a democracy, you cannot represent everyone at the same time, but everyone has the right to express their opinion. And the fact that the Hungarian government is blocking the EU uh, participation on this summit, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a message uh, to all friends of democracy about the uh, Hungarian government's uh, opinion. Uh, uh, on democracy, uh, and I'm sorry that uh, that I have to apologize uh, because of uh, this approach. And I ask you not to equal Hungary uh, to uh, to Viktor Orban and his government. Thank you. Uh, your your um, your words are very important and very uh, uh, well taken by us, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if I have time for one quick question. I'll just put it on the table. Perhaps we'll answer later. So, uh, because of the delay in the translation. Yes, take take a little bit more okay. time. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I just I want to circle back to Mayor Chosovsky again, one just one last time. Um, there was a, a recent restitution law adopted by Poland that effectively prevents uh, Jewish and non-Jewish families who were persecuted by the Nazis from receiving restitution for property seized during World War II. We saw some overtly anti-Semitic rallies around Poland last month. Uh, Mayor, uh, President Duda denounced those, but I, I'm wondering if you could speak to what's been done in Warsaw to uh, to protect the Jewish community specifically in response to the rise in anti-Semitism and and whether you whether the Jewish community uh, feels safe in Warsaw and Poland more generally. Yes, un unfortunately, we had those incidents in, in Poland that we are all ashamed of, and it's very good that the president Duda denounced them. And, and uh, those guys were actually caught by police and they will be prosecuted. We do everything we can to, to protect all the minorities in Warsaw. And unfortunately, for example, on our national holiday, Independence Day, you know, the government allowed for the quasi-fascist uh, organizations uh, to actually take over that day and, and, uh, and organize the festivities. And I was in court 
uh, fighting for, so, so that these elements could not uh, organize rallies on the streets of Warsaw, and I won. Uh, but the government, at the end of the day, decided to, to, to sort of give an umbrella to some of those elements. And make no mistake, some of those guys are, are, are just, you know, nationalistic elements. But unfortunately, the things that they said, of course, uh, should never be condoned. We do everything that we can to protect minorities. That's my job. I'm the mayor of a city. You know, we need to not to meddle with, with the affairs of those who get by and protect all of those who are weaker, minorities, senior citizens, people with disabilities. That's what we do. That's our mission, the mission of the local government. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to finish again just where I started. This has been an inspiring <coughs> hearing. I'm so grateful to our witnesses, to these mayors, and I look forward to continuing these conversations to advance democracy uh, in Europe and, uh, and, and ensure the continuation of the strongest possible liberal democracies. And I thank you very much. Yield back. Thank you. And I couldn't agree more uh, with the uh, tenor and, and the remarks and the significance of our witnesses' uh, testimony, how inspiring that is. Now, uh, our next uh, uh, member that will have questions is a former mayor uh, and a person who had a leadership role in our national associations with mayors. Uh, and now he's our, our congressman uh, and he's recognized. Uh, so it's one of your colleagues uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for this hearing. And, you know, thank you to these extraordinary mayors uh, for being here. And those of us who served as mayors are not at all surprised that mayors are going to save democracy around the world. Um, and just thank you for the cities uh, that the uh, organization you founded. Um, you know, we always tout cities as the great innovators, the incubators of great ideas, the place in government closest to the people. And so the work that you are doing to preserve democracy around the world is extraordinary. And as Congressman Joyce said, really inspiring to hear. Um, and we, as members of Congress, want to support you in every way that we can. And so my first question is um, to Mayor Truskowski. Uh, you talked about the vicious campaign against the LGBTQ community. And obviously, you know, the diversity of cities is one of the great strengths of cities. Could you speak a little bit about what the national government was doing and how we can productively work with you and other cities to help support vulnerable populations, whether it be the LGBTQ community, the Jewish community, as uh, Congressman Deutsch mentioned, or other marginalized communities. Uh, Congressman, thank you very much for, for, for that question. It is very important. Warsaw was always a proud city, a proud city of its diversity. We had a huge uh, Jewish minority before the war. We had other minorities, German minority, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, we will always fight for diversity in, in our city. And we are in agreement in all the cities on, on, in Poland that, that that's what we need to do. And that's why we protect minorities. I was one of the first mayors to sign the LGBT uh, charter in, in uh, Warsaw because I wanted to protect uh, the minority. I wanted to allow for, for more tolerance in schools. I, I wanted to actually talk about this subject. We've created, a, a, for example, a shelter for uh, people from LGBT community who are just thrown out of their houses. And I was viciously attacked by uh, the media, the, the public media outlet, and by the government because they cynically wanted to use that as an argument to fight mayors in Poland. And then when I was running a presidential campaign, they used it against me because they wanted to stoke up uh, xenophobia and, and, and homophobia. Uh, for example, the, the, you know, the, the president of the Republic was on record saying that, and other officials uh, saying that, uh, that LGBT is not, uh, those are not people but ideology and so on and so, and so, on and so forth. Uh, but we will keep on fighting because uh, we think that, that our beautiful cities should remain open and, and transparent uh, and we will not allow uh, anyone to, to attack uh, our citizens who, who, who have full rights. And as I said, that's our mission. Whoever is attacked... Uh, in Warsaw will be defended uh, by, by me and by, by the people who, who work with me. We will never allow it. And, and again, it was just used cynically by the government because they, they always uh, undertake uh, such attacks when they see or think that they can score some points. And, and may I ask, um, Mayor Veo, and uh, whether or not the role of social media, what role it's played in terms of disseminating information that has led to the undermining of democratic institutions the marginalization of, of minority populations and what role uh, that has played in your country, in your city. Mayor Vallow.
Can you hear me? Ah, perfect. Yes. I, I mean, today <laughs> we we already knew, know that what we thought that is going to be an instrument for democracy, for better better democracy, is becoming an instrument for hate. Uh, th this is what we strongly feel that uh, um, social some social networks are just not protecting the democracy enough, just giving the the podium and stage to to the hate speech, to to populism, and to people who. Are, are pressing hard to, to minorities. That's also what's happening in Slovakia, I think around all the Europe. So in my case, uh, again, I'm going back to the trust and the relations with the citizen. Uh, what we are trying to do is to, to, to explain, to communicate, and to uh, really show we, we have all the instrument. We, if we are not a populist, we are liberal mayors, let's say, we have only instruments how to fight it to show our results, to show the work. The yeah. work must be done, and that's the only way how we how we can can show people that democracy is is working. Thank that's you, Mayor. Uh, I'm just going to give one last question, Mayor Krakowski. I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. Um, I had a very uh, interesting conversation with Prime Minister Orban when I visited uh, Hungary, and he said, you know, there are three areas of common interest: economics, security, and human rights. When I pressed him about the human rights issue, he said, isn't two out of three enough? I tried to make the case that they were related and two out of three is not enough. But would you speak a little bit about the role of the Chinese and Russian investments in Hungary and how that is impacting the or influencing the tra trajectory of democracy in Hungary and how we can effectively um, work with you as a mayor of a city to promote democracy and human rights? Orbán Viktor egyszer azt is mondta egy beszélgetésben, Once, uh, hogy Prime Minister soha ne azt nézzél, amit mondok, hanem azt, amit teszek. That you shouldn't see, look at what um, I say, but what I do. So this is how you can translate his politics. So he says something, uh, he does lip service, and he says that he serves human rights and democracy. But at the same time, you can see that he does everything, what you can see in Poland, this, uh, these attacks uh, against different communities. For example, here in Hungary, again, uh, there's an attack against sexual minorities. It is very important to point out that uh, democracy and uh, pushing it, marginalizing it, and opening uh, towards the Russians and Chinese. These two go hand in hand. And as I have mentioned earlier, the Hungarian government is eager to build on the investments from Russia and China, and obviously it is paid by Hungarian taxpayers, but uh, they serve Chinese and Russian interests. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that within the Ukraine, European Union, within the Commission, uh, there's a, a, a representative, a Hungarian representative, who is responsible for the Western Balkans extension. And and uh, they did everything um, to to increase uh, Chinese uh, influence there. The Budapest-Belgrade railway is closely connected uh, with the thought that China wants to have uh, oversight over critical infrastructure so that they can have access to West Balkan ports, so that they can get Chinese uh, goods to Europe uh, through these ports. So they have economic interests, and Hungary does not have any economic interests here, only those companies which are close to the Fidesz party, the ruling party. For me, uh, the extension of the European Union is very important. Um, and but at the same time, I think the EU and the US should closely follow not only EU countries, but also the Western Balkans region, where there's a very strong Chinese influence. And Hungary is something like a Trojan uh, horse within the EU, because uh, it wants to represent this influence within the EU, and this way they weaken our uh, international alliance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Mayor, uh, and uh, the chair now recognizes 
Representative Titus from Nevada. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to our mayors. It's been most interesting and very impressive and uh, reassuring as we see democracy backslide in so many parts of the world to hear your values and what you all are doing. We heard a little bit about the harassment under one presidential campaign, but just speaking politically, is being such a popular mayor in your city a good stepping stone politically to run for national office where you might find yourself with some support from over here? Well, yes, of course, you know, th there is this understanding, uh, increasing understanding that uh, democracy at the local level is very important. So when you're doing a good job uh, at your hometown or at your regional level, uh, that allows you to, to, to actually carry the banner of democracy, of values, of freedoms further. Yes, that's true. Well, that, that's reassuring. I, I, let me ask you this. In the U.S. with our federal system, there are a number of laws and constitutional provisions and systemic um, features that make local governments have to cooperate with the federal government. You know, they do some of the implementation, some of the carrying out of policy. Sometimes there are too many strings attached. It can be both good and bad. You don't seem to have that relationship generally with the national government. But I think in the case of uh, Hungary, have you seen some negative impact from this power you're gaining through the PAC? And in the case of Prague and Czech, and, uh, Czech Republic, are you seeing something positive coming from the fact that your party is now part of the national coalition? Is it really just political? Or are there systemic things that also affect that relationship? Anybody? Well, I mean, you know, I'll just say three sentences. I mean, the problem is that the national government is treating local government almost as an enemy. So they're uh, trying to do whatever they, they can to take away our prerogatives, to take away our money. For example, half of the taxes stay in the local government. So now they're changing the tax code in order to... Uh, to, to, to actually take money away from us. So it is problematic. And even when we fight together uh, the pandemia, you know, we try to collaborate, but unfortunately, you know, the government is introducing politics into that as well. That's why, you know, we have to keep on fighting because the local government is so important. Any other mayor want to comment? Uh, Budapest, mayor? Unfortunately, we have a similar process in the past years. In the past two years, since I've been mayor of Budapest, our city has lost 40% of our income. And this loss uh, was uh, not because of the pandemic, it was mainly because of uh, governmental steps which targeted uh, the droning of our city. And they do not look at us as a partner uh, who are uh, legitimate uh, partners. Uh, they look at us as a power challenge, and they know it all too well that if the municipality is successful, then it will be visible that uh, they are not so strong. They only want to have power and uh, they want to influence politics. With such an amount of loss of money, you are just unable to, to manage that. And for us, uh, uh, next April, the elections are going to be of key importance. A lot of things will be decided uh, in the April of 2022 in Hungary, among others, uh, the fate of municipalities. Because without money, uh, even the best mayor cannot do anything for the development of the city. Now that the pact of cities has uh, free cities is growing, I think from four to about twenty, does this strengthen your power, or what? Are, who are, do you find international partners and things that you can work on across lines, uh, even if you can't work with your own government? Yes, of course, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, today what really counts is access to knowledge, access to facts, you know, that we can actually look at the best practices that we can benchmark together. Uh, we are doing it in very different fora. As mentioned by Mayor Vallo, we, for example, were uh, fortunate to participate in Bloomberg Harvard Initiative, but we are also, Warsaw is the only city from the region which is part of the C40 
uh, organization which fights climate change. But the Pact of the Free Cities also allows us a platform to collaborate. And for example, where we are lobbying within the European Union so that at least a small part of the money can be used directly with the local government so that it doesn't go through the national government but we can realize certain projects together such as for example taking the diesel powered buses off the streets of european cities we are very much much more uh, much more effective when we do it with other cities such as london or paris or 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 florence or milan well thank you very much mr chairman i think a lot of this is worth pursuing uh getting more sorry that's quite interesting and valuable Sorry, if I may add yeah. just a short comment on this. Actually, I believe that the situation of uh, my colleagues in Poland, uh, in, in Warsaw, and in Budapest, in Hungary, is actually much harder than our position here, judging from the information from them and the situation on the with the media and so on, and also with the finance. But actually, we had experience recently, that means um, a year ago, Actually, a similar situation when the central government had lowered the taxes, which could be a, a good thing, but at first they didn't have a, a relevant savings plan. And second, they actually lowered the taxes that is used for financing the cities. So they basically took the money from us. And this is actually how the authoritarian regimes start. They take away the money from the cities that means that they are usually subsidy programs only the friends got the subsidies and if you suddenly became a non-friend you were a friend but you became a non-friend that means that probably some audit or some 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 people will come and they will try to criminalize you for for example some formal problems uh, with the subsidy and there is always some and this is actually, I think, the way how the authoritarian regimes start. And this was a situation that was uh, very, very imminent in Czech Republic a year ago. But we have uh, had uh, opposed that and we had, let's say, at least partially uh, saved the situation. Interesting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Chair recognizes Representative uh, Costa for five minutes. Is Representative Costa here? I can see him on the screen. Representative Costa? Schneider. Okay, we'll move to uh, Representative Schneider. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of our witnesses today, uh, not just for sharing your uh, vision, experience and experiences and perspectives with us in this hearing, but for what you guys are doing uh, collectively and, and with your uh, colleagues in, in the pack. You know, I've been struggling to conceptualize the, the threats to liberal democracy, democracy, small L, small D, and uh, I, I earlier in the conversation, uh, the, the term uh, nationalist uh, populism, uh, which is as good a definition of the opposite, opposite of liberal democracy as, as I can, can think of. And um, I believe it was uh, Mayor Drozkowski who said that the, the national governments are treating the cities as the enemy. And the, the flip side of that is also that uh, the cities and the work you are doing in defending and protecting and, and, and nurturing liberal democracy is a challenge to those who are seeking power uh, and, 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 and trying to establish their legitimacy for their nationalist aims. So my broad question for the group is, what do you see as the biggest threats to uh, the ongoing ability of the pact to hold together and to continue to um, nurture and, and develop liberal democracy? Uh, and second backup question of that is, what can United States, and to the extent that we can be involved as, as the United States Congress, do to support your efforts, uh, in addition to giving you a forum like we have today. Well, Congressman, if I may, of course, we will persevere. We will keep on uh, collaborating. 
uh, and nothing will change that. But of course, you know, why, why the, the local government is under attack in Poland and why they are trying to take away money from us, institute centralized programs, and then they distribute money according to political criteria. Because we are independent. You know, all the independent uh, institutions are under attack because uh, the, the, the government does not, uh, the current government does not like independent institutions. But we are strong enough and, and you know, the, the civil society is strong enough for us to be effective. But at the end of the day, yes, I mean, they take away prerogatives, they take away the money, but we keep on doing what we're doing. And the important thing is that, and that, that's what I said in my opening remarks, is that you need to stay committed. The United States of America, the European Union, and we need to, uh, to do whatever we can to support networks such as the Pact of Free Cities or other networks that we collaborate uh, with, with, for example, the, the cities of uh, of um, uh, the mayors of, of, of the cities of the United States, because we can really do a lot of things together, uh, exchange information. And so, for example, we were working together throughout the pandemic, and the information that we had from our American colleagues helped us a lot in, in managing better our hospitals. So there's a lot we can do. I mean, helping directly. And it's, it's not only a question of money. It's a question of creating fora, create, you know, supporting institutions or networks uh, that really help us do what we do. Uh, thank you. I don't know if any of the other mayors want to add to that. Uh, maybe I, I just want to uh, to outline, uh, underline everything uh, Mayor Trzaskowski just said. I mean, it's it's we are on the same place, and we are in the same place, and and it's it's very for us important to to keep the cooperation co uh, going on. And of course, any help from outside, any any help to any network which is fighting for for democracy here in Europe is a big help. Great, uh, thank you. And before I go to my next question, uh, Mayor Bello, I, I, the sign behind you—it always seems impossible until it's done. I love that quote. Uh, a variation quoting someone, uh, our, our former Secretary of State, Condi Rice, is making the impossible seem inevitable in retrospect. And I think that's the challenge we all face in uh, in serving our communities and in. Uh, ensuring liberal democracy is is the the, the path we can all proceed. Um, let me turn again to um, Mayor uh, Trzaskowski. I'm sorry for uh, butchering your name, but uh, following up on what uh, Congressman Deutsch touched on, and, and I, I appreciate appreciate your answer about rising anti-Semitism, and we're seeing it not just in Europe but uh, across the globe, and um, very much appreciated your answer. But speaking to more broadly the, the Jewish community in Poland and uh, this probably can apply to communities everywhere. What are you saying to the community to tell them that uh, there is a place for them in Poland, in Poland's future, and that they're, they're safe and secure in their homes? Yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. I will just add one thing because you said what the United States can do. I mean, what, what we are doing in, in, in Poland and Hungary and Czech Republic and other, and other cities, you know, we are supporting the non-governmental organizations which do a lot of work for us. They fight homophobia, they, they work with minorities, they help refugees and so on and so forth. That's why we should keep on supporting them. But answering your question, I mean, I wanted to say that, you know, Poland is one of the safest countries in Europe. And, uh, and when it comes to safeguarding, you know, the rights, the constitutional rights of uh, the minorities, we do whatever we can. And, and uh, I have to say, honestly, that there is no agreement of the conservative government to attack, for example, our Jewish uh, minority. I mean, that's it's not happening. Unfortunately, sometimes they create an atmosphere uh, in which, you know, those, those, those nationalistic elements uh, can actually do what they do. But uh, I can assure you that the Jewish community in Warsaw is safe. We are doing everything to, to collaborate with them. And of course, they're part of our DNA, part of our culture in, in, in Warsaw. Uh, and, and, and of course, they have an incredibly important, uh, important part of, of our life. That's why we support the Museum of Polish Jews, where we show the contribution of Polish Jews to our, to our nation, to, 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 to the development uh, uh, of Poland. That's why uh, they're springing up you know, Jewish schools in Warsaw and other cities, and the Jewish uh, culture is incredibly vibrant uh, in Poland. And we will keep on supporting that because that's what gives us richness and diversity that Warsaw was always uh, so well known for. Uh, and, and we will keep on doing that regardless of whatever happens. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And just in closing, I had a chance to first visit Warsaw in 1990. Um, 
before World War II, Warsaw was one third Jewish and it is a part of the, the history of Poland. Uh, I'm grateful for your, your remarks and to everybody, thank you again for all you're doing. I look forward to continuing our conversations and, and working to make sure that we're supporting what you all are doing, but also collaborating uh, to do this work around the world together. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you for this hearing. Representative, and uh, thank all the committee members that participated uh, with all that's going on uh, around uh, Congress right now. We had amazing participation from our members because uh, of the interest uh, of the mayors that were here today. Uh, your comments have inspired, informed, uh, and I hope create a continuation of a dialogue that we can have on the important issues, the shared values that we have. While we were here in this hearing, the world goes on and uh, I'll inform you that uh, during this time, the U.S. has uh, announced sanctions, uh, further sanctions against uh, Belarus uh, for their actions targeting migrant smuggling and victimization of migrants. And also Russia has issued a, a warning uh, of fight in the uh, separatist uh, Donbass region, as they describe it, as they term it. Uh, so we can see going ahead the challenges that we have uh, in front of us, um, the threats of secu to security and military action and aggressiveness, uh, the use of uh, economic factors, particularly energy, to break this unity to break this greatest strength that we share together, uh, our coalition, uh, our transatlantic coalition, our European US coalition for uh, our shared values uh, and for democracy. I hope those that uh, from an authoritarian standpoint uh, realize, and I hope this hearing was greater proof that these type of uh, aggressive actions uh, these heavy handed actions, these authoritarian actions, potentially these military actions will never be ultimately successful. If we hold together in unity and we surround ourselves in the core of shared values and beliefs in democracy. And when you look at this from any of those standpoints, a security standpoint, a military standpoint, an economic standpoint, the strong pillars of our major cities remain one of the most critical elements of this united strength. So your leadership, what you said today, your beliefs, your courage in going forward is not just important to the present, but we will face continued and I'm afraid greater challenges in the near future. And this alliance to our transatlantic and shared democratic beliefs, uh, which all four of our witnesses uh, displayed today with great strength and courage, will continue to inspire all of us uh, in this coalition as we go forward. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time you've taken, the content of what you've said, the strength of what you've conveyed, strength in democracy and strength that will be, I believe, a bond to the people you represent, because ultimately it's those people in our countries and we can't fail to recognize this. And I think uh, there's some comments that were made before uh, about don't give up on us. Uh, we look to your people. Uh, and as you do as mayors, uh, as the strength. Uh, so we look to continue to work together, even given greater challenges we may face. So thank you so much for being here. This was one of the most important hearings uh, that we have had, uh, and it was because of your participation and what you had to say. So I, I wanna thank you and remind the members we have five days to submit statements, uh, extraneous materials and questions for the record subject to uh, the rules of this committee. Uh, again, thank you for this important hearing. Uh, and with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned.